continue the introduction in a few minutes. <laughs> so we give Jeremy all the time he wants, and uh, he'll share with you. You can ask some questions also. Jeremy. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much for being so patient. I apologize uh, for being a little bit late. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. It's a thrill to meet you all. There's a lot of new faces here. Um, so in a nutshell, I guess I should introduce myself because it seems like there's a lot of people that I've never met before. So um, it's confusing because my English is pretty good, uh, but I'm, I'm from Judea. I'm far more Israeli than I am American, but I did spend some time in Atlanta, Georgia. My grandfather walked from Russia to Israel in 1916. He was 15 years old. It was him and about another 20 boys and girls between the ages of 15 to 20, backpacks on their back, and they walked from Bialystok to the land of Israel for one year in four months. And, you know, my grandfather, he was an amazing man. I never got to meet him. He died before I was born. And anyone that stayed in Bialystok, any Jew that stayed there was killed by the Nazis. So he had enough vision to realize that our time was up there. But he also had enough hope to walk to the promised land with the hopes of building the kingdom of God in the land of Israel. And so my father was born in Jerusalem. Um, his mother wanted him to become a doctor. There was only one medical school in Israel at the time, so he ended up going to America to study become a doctor. Uh, I grew up in Israel. My mother wanted me to be a lawyer. In my family, you're either a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure. Those are your options. And so he was a doctor. I ended up uh, going to law school, and he ended up on a boat in the United States, and he didn't have any money. He had $500 in his pocket. He had about 500 words of English, and he ordered, um, he bought for 50 cents the Webster's Guide to College Campuses in America. Now, when I went to college in Israel, I had a lot of criteria. I wanted to know who the professors were. I wanted to know how many girls studied there. I wanted to know what the job did, what descriptive, you know, the reputation of the place. My father had one criteria when he chose his college in the United States. The cheapest college in America, that's what he was looking for. And he found that the cheapest college in the United States at that time that had a pre-med program was a Baptist Bible college outside Alexandria, Louisiana. And so for a Jew from the land of Israel to get on a boat in 1960 and end up in a Baptist Bible college outside Alexandria, Louisiana, which is this outside of that little town, was unheard of, that had never happened before, that will never happen again, that was a once in a lifetime. And my father, you know, got on a Greyhound bus, got to Louisiana, knocked on their door and said, I'd like to join your institution. And, you know, my father was a Jew, ended up in a Baptist Bible college. And when my father had no one around him and he was all alone, it was good Christians living by biblical values to be kind to the stranger that they just loved my dad. And when he had no one around him, they supported him, they loved him. And um, without those people even knowing, I, you know, I'm an Orthodox Jewish rabbi in Israel but I have a heart for Christians. And without those people knowing that random act of kindness, the multi-generational effect, you know, as they were building, they were... Is that okay? There we are. They were building the heart that I have for Christians today. So random acts of kindness, who knows what effect it might have that a Jew from Judea has come all the way to Amarillo, Texas to speak to an audience to continue to build those bridges and to see where God leads us together. And so there's a fun story. I'll tell it as quick as I can. My father is the hardest working man that I've ever met. And so it's not easy to, to you know, get into medical school in America either. And so we still have his textbooks. And over every other Hebrew word is an English word written. Uh, an, on every English word is a Hebrew word written in pen. Every third or fourth word, another word written in pen. So he said, not with Google, but with a dictionary and translated entire textbooks, page after page, into Hebrew just so he could understand what to read to then study for the test. So he was putting in 18 hours a day of studying uh, to try to get into medical school. And it was one Saturday night, his friends came to him and said, listen, you study all the time. I mean, people of the book, this is crazy. You should come out and we're going, there's a game tonight. And my dad said, really, what game? What game are we going to play? He says, no, no, silly Jew from Israel. We're not going to play a game. The college team has a football game tonight. And my dad said, football? I love football. I was so busy playing football in Israel that I had to get on a boat to come to this place to begin with. Because in Israel, kadu regel is translated as football. But in Hebrew, that means soccer. 
So my dad tells me that he goes to the stadium expecting to see a soccer game, and then he sees these big, ugly Americans with helmets on their heads killing each other on the field. And he was like, what did America do to soccer? What is this? And he pays close attention to the game, and he sees at one point that they kick this egg-shaped ball through a big H, which, of course, we would call a field goal. And the crowd went wild. And my dad sort of looked at them and said, well, you know, I play a different kind of football in Israel. I want you to know I could kick that little egg through that big H. It's, it's not a big deal at all. And he says, well, what would a Jew from Israel know anything about American football? And he's like, I don't know anything about American football, but let me tell you, I can kick that little egg through that big H. And he says, really, could you show us? And he said, sure. So Sunday morning, they went to the football field, put the ball on the 20-yard line, and you can Google this, you can YouTube this. Every single kicker in the United States of America, in college, in high school, in the NFL, they all wore these funny shoes where they would shave off the toe, and they would run at the ball straight on just like this, and they would kick the ball like that, every single one of them. My dad put the ball on and stood at it like an angle, and he swung at it like a soccer ball, like every kicker does in America today. And the people in Louisiana, well, they saw that, what is this boy doing? And it went right through, and they said, well, well, what was that? So they put the ball on the 25-yard line. And my dad swung at it, and it went right through, and they're getting really excited. And then they put the ball on the 30-yard line, and my dad didn't miss. And then my dad eventually was like, you know, guys, there's no goalie here. <laughs> you, know, you know where I come from? There's someone trying to stop you. This is, this is really easy. I want you all to know that. And they're just getting so excited. And eventually, well, to make a long story short, um, at the 45-yard line when my dad didn't miss. My dad's quite an athlete. Um, this is how he tells the story. <laughs> a hush came over the field. <laughs> we have a secret weapon from Israel. <laughs> and then my dad became the star of the football team. They were really a terrible team. It's a Baptist Bible college. They weren't football players, so they could never really get it in the end zone, but now they didn't have to. Make it halfway down the field, let my dad kick a field goal. <laughs> and my dad became the high scorer on the football team. And so he was so good, he got a full paid scholarship to Oklahoma University. And then somehow, just you never know, and somehow he made it into medical school and God has his ways. And so there was another guy at the same time in early 1960s from Hungary that introduced European soccer style kicking to American football. The, he, my dad was actually drafted to the Chicago Bears spring training. And he was like, my mom will kill me. <laughs> he wants me to be a doctor, not a football player. And so, but that guy from Hungary, he went into the NFL and he's in the Hall of Fame. And no one knows that it was actually a Jew from the land of Israel that introduced soccer style kicking to American football. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Well... So um, it was 1991, the Gulf War had broken out, Saddam Hussein and all of that went on, and it was at that time that my two oldest brothers, they were at university at the time, at New York University, um, Scud missiles were being dropped all over Israel. Well, they dropped out of university and just moved to Israel. That was it. That, they felt that that was their calling. And I remember I was only 11 at the time, and my parents almost had a heart attack but you know, they're already 18, 19 years old, they can do what they want, and they decided to go back to the land of Israel. And then, you know, in Israel, you never know, a little war like that, that just may erupt into Armageddon, that just may be a world war, you never know what might happen. But the war sort of died down, and then that summer, my parents looked around, and the dream was always that my father would get his medical license, move back to the land of Israel, and heal the sick in the Holy Land. It's like, beautiful. And well, my two oldest brothers moved back, and my parents said, well, I guess it's time for us to go. So I was 11 years old at the time. We picked up, and then we moved back to the land of Israel. And well, that's how my English is pretty good. But that's really interesting, because if you see that little story of my grandfather until now, there's a real movement that happened there. The beginning of our return to the land of Israel um, the Jewish people running away. They were running away from Muslim oppression. They were running away from what would be the Holocaust, um, you know, in the 1940s. But when my family came back in 1991, we weren't running away from Atlanta, Georgia. We loved the Falcons. We loved watching them lose. I mean, we had a great life in the United States, but my family wasn't running away from the United States. We were running to Israel. And that's a totally different type of coming. And so, it's interesting because a lot of people, they look at the land of Israel today and they're like, well, I don't really, I mean, is that, 
Is that biblical prophecy? Is that the beginning of the redemption? Is something really marvelous happening in the land? But we look, the beginning of Israel wasn't very religious. I mean, my grandfather, walking for a year and a half, he stopped keeping kosher, and he sort of like joined the kibbutz movement, and most of the beginnings of Israel were like a secular movement. It was really almost in some ways an anti-religious movement. They're like, we're waiting for Messiah to come. The heck with that, we're just walking. That's it, we're, oh, we're done with this. We're gonna do it on our own. And a lot of people look at the state of Israel today and they say, well, how could it be that such a holy process such as the redemption of Israel and ultimately biblical destiny would unfold with people that don't have a heart for God? I mean, in the kibbutz that my grandfather first joined, it was so secular he eventually left that kibbutz. Because on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of the year, where Jews around the world fast for more than 24 hours, they would actually host barbecues with non-kosher food on the Sea of Galilee just to spite God after what he did to the Jewish people in the Holocaust. They're like a heart of stone. And you're like, well, that's going to be the original movement of Israel. Like, is that, could that possibly be something But the kingdom of God is going to be built like that? So here's a beautiful vision that's in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 36. And here's what it says. I will take you from among the nations and gather you from all the lands, and I will bring you to your own soil. Then I will sprinkle pure water upon you that you may become cleansed. I will cleanse you from all your contaminations and from all your idols. Meaning here, the people of Israel come back to the land and they need to be clean. They, they're like contaminated. Communism took everything away from the Jewish people. We had no religion. All of the nation, we, we come back and we look at what it says. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and I will make it so that you will follow my decrees and guard my commandments and fulfill them. And so it says that actually the people of Israel that come back to the land of Israel at the beginning, they're going to have a heart of stone. They're not going to have a heart for God. And then inside the land of Israel, a revival is going to take place. God is somehow going to pour his spirit out upon that land, and something different is going to happen. Now watch this. Every country in the world, the more prosperous they become, the more they forget God. It happened all over the Europe. It's happening in the United States of America. Every country in the world, there's only one country that as we're becoming stronger and as we're becoming more prosperous, we're becoming more faithful. We're becoming more religious. We're becoming more conservative, and that's Israel. There are more synagogues in the land of Israel, more Torah institutions where people are studying Bible in the land of Israel than ever before in the history of the world. There are more people praying in Jerusalem right now than there ever have been ever. And so we're seeing actually right beneath the surface something amazing is happening. And so here's now where I want to tell you where my personal story joins in with that. My wife and I, we have been married. Now this August will be 20 years. And we had a, a covenant to our relationship, um, an alliance. You know, in Western culture, it's kind of like, well, what does this girl do for me? And well, wait, what do I do for her? And what am I getting out of this? And is this good a good match? So in the Judean mind, in the biblical version of marriage, it's a breed, it's a covenant that we come together in order to go and fix the world. We go to get, we're coming together on a mission. We're, our union isn't even about us as much as it is what are we going to contribute to the world? How are we going to bring God's light into the world? And our covenant, where it takes us, we want to live with God guiding our life. We want to live a guided life. How do we come to that? For years, I have been struggling my whole life with this question. What is it's Abraham? I mean, Abraham is the first Jew. He's the father of every Christian. He's the father of every Muslim. He was promised to be the father of many nations, and that promise has come to pass. He is the father. And he didn't have a religion at all. There was, I mean, Moses was, he didn't, Moses hadn't arrived yet. There was no law given. It was just Abraham living on his own, somehow praying to God, having a relationship with God. And then decades, generations later, hundreds of years later, Moses arrives, gives us the Torah, 
gives us laws, the Ten Commandments, rules and regulations. And then after that, there was a temple in Jerusalem with animal sacrifices. And out of that, Jesus emerged and brought a whole new light to nations all around the world. Then rabbinic Judaism emerged out of that after the temple was destroyed. The Judaism that was practiced for 2,000 years emerged out of that where prayer substituted for sacrifice. And here we are today, 2022, and there's Facebook and Instagram. And what is the connection between all of those? I mean, Abraham to Moses to the temple to, uh, I mean, what is, I mean, we, it somehow it's, there's seemingly a connection, but on the outside, they're totally, totally different. Like, what is the connection between all of that? Is there a common thread? Is there a heart that beats through that, a common soul? Well, if we can get to the heart of it, then maybe we could really have a breakthrough. And so I'm sure there's a lot of answers, but what touched our hearts the most is that what seems to be the guiding principle between all of those different expressions of that faith and who he was. And all right, guys, good luck. You're farmers. Do your farmer thing. And then I, you know, walked around and I'd never, and I went to the edge of the mountain. And what happens in Israel is the mountains of Judea meet the Judean desert. And then after the Judean desert, you get to the Dead Sea. So really from one of the highest mountains in the land of Israel, it drops to the lowest place on the planet. So the views are like, they're like unlike anything in the world. I was in the Colorado Rockies. They fall, they drop, but not like this. It's like breathtaking, intoxicating. I've tried to make music videos with drones. I've tried to capture the magic. But until you see it with your own eyes, it's like no view anywhere else, ever, anywhere. And I get to the edge of the cliff where my staff house now is standing. And I don't know how to explain spiritual things in physical words, but if I had to, it felt like my soul leaped out of my body, was doing cartwheels in the air, and then went into the rocks. And I was like, oh, whoa, what, wow, what was that? And it was like call, it was my, my called to that land. Guard this land. This place is holy. This place, you are connected to this land. And it was so overwhelming. It took me days to process. I didn't know what had just happened. But I sort of went home and I spent Shabbat. And then Sunday I went back to that mountain. And then Monday I went back. And Tuesday I went back. And I just kept on going back. I mean, it's been now seven years. A day has not gone by. If I was in the land of Israel, that I wasn't back on that mountain. My soul, I had to go visit my soul. It was stuck in the rocks there. I just kept on going back. I was just pulling me to that mountain. And so I just kept on going there and I kept on telling my wife, Tehillah, I'm like, gosh, Tehillah, you have to come and see this farm. You have to see this mountain tub. And she's very busy. She's like, Tehillah, Jeremy, I don't have time for you. I have six kids. I'm a lawyer. I don't have time for you. I can't do this. And I just kept on telling her about this magical place in the mountains of Judea. And at one point, I'm sitting down there, and eventually I just had a morning routine. I would wake up early in the morning, I would go out to the mountain, I would have my morning prayers in the mountain there, and then I would go off to work in Jerusalem. It was a bit of a detour, but that just became what I did because I just loved that mountain so much. And then at one point, I saw my partner, Yossi, come out with these olive trees, and they were about 10 years old. They were about this tall, and they were donated from a, an olive tree grower somewhere in the middle of Israel. And they heard about this beautiful mountain that's being settled. And they said, well, we want to contribute to that. Take our olive trees. And he started planting olive trees all around the mountain. And I don't know what to say, but, you know, I grew up on the legends of my grandfather. And for the first two years when he was in Israel, he planted eucalyptus trees all around the Sea of Galilee. Because outside around the Sea of Galilee were swamps. It was just total. Just, people were dying of malaria. It was uninhabitable. In the northern part of Israel, it was swamps. Southern Israel was desert. Just an abandoned, lost land. And my grandfather made the Galilee beautiful. And until today, when we go up to the Sea of Galilee, we see these hundred-year-old huge eucalyptus trees. Our family takes great pride in the fact that my children's great-grandfather planted those trees with his hands. And I saw this Jew in the mountain planting trees in the edge of the desert. And I'm like, you can be a pioneer in 2015? Wow, I am in. I want to, I, I, I don't want to just visit here. I want to help. So I went up to Yossi. I'm like, Yossi, that's it. I come here to pray every morning. You've seen me now for a few weeks. I, what can I do to help? I want to help this project. I want to help whatever I can. He's like, well, that's really good timing because we need to bring a water line out to the mountain. I'm like, you 
planted trees in the desert without any water. And that's crazy. And I didn't know, but I was watching the next morning. He came there with his truck and he had a big water tanker behind him and he would water the trees with his hand going around the mountain early in the morning, watering the trees with his hand. And he's like, listen, I have a job. I have seven kids. I can't do this every morning. This is going to kill me. We really need to bring a water line out there and then we can spread irrigation and we can water these trees properly. And I was like, wow, okay. Well, well, what does that mean exactly? He's like, well, the, the water tower is on the community four mountaintops over over there. It's three kilometers away, and the piping, the infrastructure, the tractors, and the pump to get it up the mountain, it'll be about 110,000 shekels. We've priced it out. And that at that time was about $25,000. And every month for about four years, Tehillah and I put a little bit of money aside in our savings account to buy a seven-seater for our fifth kid. And what could I do? I had exactly 110,000 shekels in my bank account. So I went to Tehillah and I said, Tehillah, we have the opportunity of a lifetime. We can bring the water infrastructure to the deepest mountain in the mountains of Judea and settle a mountain in the land of Israel. Let's mortgage our tithes. And she's like, mortgage our what? I'm like, you know, well, we mortgage our tithes. Well, you know, we give 10% of our money that we make every month. We give it to charity. We're pretty strict about that. And I was, let's just give Yossi all of our money, and then we won't give charity for like five years. We'll mortgage it. We'll give it now on ahead of time. And she's like, Morgan, I don't think I've ever heard of that before. And I was like, you just have to come out to the mountain. And finally, she agreed to come out to the mountain because we're really two sides of the same soul. She stood out of the car, saw where we were, and she's like, okay, let's do it. And I'm just married to the most amazing woman in the world. So the very next day, I went to the bank. I'm like, I'd like 110,000 shekels cash, please. And the teller was like, it's a little community bank, 100. And they called a security guard. They called the thing. And they start stacking up hundreds of shekels of bills in little stacks of 200 on the thing. I start putting it in my backpack like I'm in the mafia. I didn't know. I never had held so much money in my life. And my, I was like, don't lose this bag. And I walked over to Yossi. And I was like, here, Yossi, here's all of my money. Let's bring the water line out to the mountain. And that was the beginning of my relationship with this place. That was it. Everyone sort of has a project that they're involved with in their life. Maybe it's their church. Maybe it's their synagogue. Maybe it's an old age home. Maybe it's an orphanage. Maybe it's a, you know, a secondhand store that's helping. I'd every, this became, okay, this is what I'm going to be. This is my project. Now I am all in. This is what, so I did whatever I could to bring groups there, to try to bring donors there, to try to, to let's develop this mountain. And I started learning about the mountain. And I'm like, what is it about this place? Because everyone that comes there, they can be a Jew from Brooklyn, they can be a secular Jew from Tel Aviv. They can be a Catholic from Germany. They can be an evangelical Christian from Texas. They come to this mountain from all these different backgrounds, and people start to cry. Some people, they just walk out of their car, stand on the mountain, and immediately they start crying. Some people, they need to walk around a little bit, and then they start to cry. Everyone is filled with a magic, like a light. I don't know how to explain it. It's really undeniable, because I've been there now for seven years, and I've seen it every single time. Something happens on that mountain. So I'm like, what is this mountain in the Bible? So I start looking at the maps and start reading the stories to try to figure it out. So in the Bible, in the book of Samuel, the mountains in which our farm is located are called the mountains of Zif, Z-I-F. In the book of Samuel, David is still young, and he slays Goliath. And the king of Israel becomes insanely jealous, tries to kill David, sends the armies of Israel out to hunt one man. And it says that David escapes to the mountains, the caves, and the wilderness of Zif, of Z-I-F. We're about 15 minutes outside of Bethlehem. And I was like, well, this is right here. There's a story where David is in a cave and Saul comes into the cave and David cuts off a piece of his coat. And then Saul walks out of the cave and then David says, king, why are you trying to hunt me? I'm loyal to the king. And the king says, no, you're an enemy of Israel. And he holds up the piece of his coat and says, I could have killed you right now. I'm loyal to the king. So that happened in the En Gedi Spring. Our farm, the Aru Goat Farm, the valley is the top of that spring. It's an eight-hour hike from our farm right down to the En Gedi Spring next to, the, it's all of that story happened there. King David assembled his mighty men in those mountains, in those caves. I start learning a little bit more. Why did David run to the mountains of Zif? Because growing up in Atlanta, I don't know, it just sounds like places and words, there's no connection. So we learned that as David was a young boy, he would take his sheep out of Bethlehem, and those were his grazing fields. So in his time of trouble, where did he go? He went to the place he knew best. He knew how to live there for weeks at a time. He would take his sheep out sometimes in the wintertime. You take your sheep out for a month straight. He knew where the water holes were. He knew which caves were comfortable. He knew how to live and survive there. So in his time of trouble, he went to the place, his backyard. But we also then discovered most of the book of Psalms 
was written in the mountains of Ziph before David became king. And so while you think about that, if you are a Catholic in Brazil, if you're a Christian in Texas, if you're a Protestant in Germany, if you're a Jew in Jerusalem, when someone wants to pray, they open up the book of Psalms. King David taught the entire world how to pray. And those prayers came into the world in those mountains. It's a holy place. And it's, it's undeniable. And so imagine that as David is there, his mighty men are assembled in those caves. And in some ways, those men were his elite commando soldiers for the rest of his career. So the armies of Israel, the kingdom in some way, was established in those mountains. And what's amazing is because, you know, when we read the stories of the Bible, they're not just stories of things that have happened. They are blueprints, templates, prophecies. They are signs of what will be in the future. Half of David's men weren't Jews. Half of David's army that were assembled in those mountains, you can read it in the book of Chronicles. Everyone knows Uriah the Hittite, who was Bathsheba's husband. Hittite is not a last name. The Hittite means he was from another nation, and he was pulled out of that nation. Believers out of each nation came and joined and built David's army. And we said, wow, we have an opportunity now to really build something beautiful. And I said to my wife, you know, we've made a commitment that we're going to try to be guided. And how do we be guided? What does that mean for us? Well, in our generation, we don't see things just happening, but we have our eyes focused on Jerusalem. Every Jew everywhere around the world prays facing Jerusalem. So imagine that every synagogue in the United States, when they build it, they bring an architect and they make sure that the prayer hall is facing east. And in Australia, every synagogue is built facing the west. And in Europe, every synagogue faces the south. And every Jew in Africa prays to the north. For 2,000 years, every time we pray, we realign with what's happening in the land of Israel, never losing focus. Because if you see what's happening in the land of Israel and you read the promises of the Bible, every promise is coming to pass in our lifetime. The ingathering of the exiles from around the world. That's the most prophesied event in the Bible. It's mentioned over 40 times. And then you see Jews from all all over the world from every nation, reassembling into the land of Israel again. That had never happened before. That had never happened since. It's happened only one time in human history. It's happened in the land of Israel. In the book of Zephaniah, it says the Hebrew language is going to be revived. It'll be lost. It'll come back to life. And eventually, everyone in the world is going to speak Hebrew. Because as soon as we get our priorities realigned, and our spiritual life matters more to us than our physical life, everyone's going to want to know Hebrew. They're going to want to read the Hebrew in the, in, the, in the Bible. They're going to want to read it in its original tongue. But I asked my dad, I was like, Abba, how did that happen? I mean, it happened in his generation. How did the Hebrew language just come back to life? And my father said, well, your grandfather had to speak to me in a language that he didn't know and in a language that didn't exist and trust that everyone in the land would make the same irrational decision and speak to their children in a language they don't know and in a language that didn't exist and everyone in the land did the same irrational thing. There were no emails, there was no Facebook, there were no WhatsApp campaigns. Somehow every Jew in the land of Israel was moved to speak to their children in a language they didn't know, in a language that didn't exist, and in one generation, the Hebrew language was revived from the dead. And so if we're committed to living a guided life, then we need to align ourselves with God's plan. If we want, we see a wave is happening, we need to catch that wave and align ourselves with what God's doing. And if we want to do that, it seems like the mountains of King David are calling us to Hila. We need to build then a window in to the Messianic era. What would it look like in the land of Israel if the Messiah was already here? The Jews returning to the land, what would it look like? Let's build that now. Most things in Israel, you're visiting the past. You're visiting old places, archeology span sites. What if people can actually come and step into the future? And what if by building that future right now, we really hasten it? We're in the mountains where King David assembled his men. Let's build a house of prayer for all nations on this mountain. And then Tehillah said, well, well, that means we're going to have to sell our home. And I was like, well, oh, that's a lot. That's a lot. And the truth is, we, I couldn't do it. It was too scary. I mean, when President Biden just came to the land of Israel right now, our farm was marked on a map. 
we are the deepest settlement in Israel today. And if you know that there is a move of the Israel returning to the land, the first city built was right on the water, Tel Aviv. And then slowly but surely, we're returning more and more into the land, more into the promise. So we're at the edge of Jewish settlement. That's the tip of the spear. That's where the rubber meets the road. Where the rubber meets the road is where you get crushed. I mean, we're going to hit resistance from the Arabs, from the left wing, from international. I mean, they might knock down our home. They might sue us in the Supreme Court. I mean, well, if we build our home there, we might just lose it all. And what about security? I mean, I have six kids. I mean, the army will not defend one family living alone on a mountain. They'll defend a community. One guy on a mountaintop? No, they don't have the man force for that. They're not going to. We will have to defend ourselves and the most contested real estate in the world. I don't know, that's a lot to ask. I know that, I mean, I knew that we had to do what we needed to do to get there, but I just wasn't courageous enough to do it. It was too much for me. So I just lived with a certain tension in my life. And I realized that at the time, it didn't feel nice to live in tension, because who wants to feel like they're not living up to who they should be? But then I realized that when Jacob is given his name, he struggles with an angel, and he wins, and the angel has to retreat, and the angel blesses him with the name Israel, and the Bible says why he was named Israel. It says, you will from now on be called Israel, for you have struggled with man, and you have struggled with God, and you have prevailed. And in some ways, to live in a tension, to live in a struggle, it's like we have who we are now, and then there is, we have this who we could be, if our soul was really revealed in the world, who we could really be, who God really created us to be. But as soon as we live in that, it's like, ugh, but I'm not there now. It's like, oh, that's a tension that I have to live with now. I guess that's what it is to be Israel, to not give up on the tension, to sort of put that pillar of fire that I'm going in that direction, even if I can't reach that place now. I have where I am now and I have where I should be. Even if I'm not there, okay, I'm just gonna live in that tension and do as best as I can to walk in that light. And that's really key. Because every morning, you know, we have two voices. I wake up really early in the land of Israel. And I, I, those voices, they, they appear every morning. The first one, at about four in the morning, it's like, Jeremy, it's so early. Go back to bed. That's my first voice. But then I have another voice. And it's like, Jeremy, it's still dark out. If you get up now, you'll be able to read. You'll be able to write. You'll be able to plan your day. You'll be a better husband. You'll be a better father. Come on, get up now when everyone's still sleeping. You'll have the best day. You'll regret it if you don't get up. Who's the real me there? I mean, those are two real voices, and they both speak like I. I am tired. Oh, but I want to get up. And so the Bible tells us that we are made quite literally of earth. God brought the earth and formed. We're made of the material of this planet. And when we die, our bodies go right back to the earth. But then in the language of the Bible, he breathed his spirit in us. We have this soul that animates us, that makes us alive. And we have two forces within us. We have a body that's calling us to the physical, calling us to sleep, calling us to comfort, calling us to food, calling us to this world. And then we have another part inside us that's calling us to truth calling us to light, calling us to love, calling us to the Torah, calling us to be who we were destined to be. And that struggle, that struggling with man, struggling with God, and we're called Israel when we prevail. And so we knew where we needed to be, but I just, it was so scary. I mean, I, it's, just, it's a lot. I mean, I have six kids. When they, we lived in a village, my brother was my next door neighbor. They had friends, they had a youth group, they had a soccer team. We'll be alone on a mountain. What are they gonna do when they come home from school? Who are they going to play with? Uh, me? I have to play with them? I guess I could be a more involved father. Well, what are we going to do to my marriage? What if Tehillah fights with me? Who's going to be my friend? I'll be alone with my wife fighting with me on a mountain. I just, oh, that doesn't seem like a good strategy. <laughs> I'd be alone on a mountain? Like, I just, that, that's a lot. I mean, what is this going to, that just seemed like out of my comfort zone. So I lived with tension. But you know, if your eyes are open, sometimes you receive guidance. And so it was five years ago, almost to the day. It was the eve of the Jewish holiday, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Truah, which is what we say the Jewish New Year. In the biblical calendar, it's when God created light, the beginning of creation. So we celebrate one of the New Years as God created the world. And so it was Saturday night. The holiday was on Sunday. 
And so Saturday night, we went to this evening of preparation, and there was music and meditation and prayer and teachings, just really beautiful. And in the middle of that night, the rabbi gets up, and he says, you know, on the biblical calendar, these are the moments right before creation, right before the big bang of let there be light. This is still in the calendar when God was dreaming up what he wanted for man before creation itself. And this is the most opportune time of the year to dream what you want for this upcoming year because quite literally God is dreaming with you. And so now take the time to dream what you want for your upcoming year. So he starts to play the clarinet and the guitarist starts to play, the percussionist is playing, and I don't know. I don't know how to dream on command. And I'm looking around, all these spiritual people are dreaming, and I'm sort of jealous of them that I'm just like sitting there. But I love music, so I'm like listening to the music, and I'm just kind of enjoying myself and kind of like, you know, I wish that I was a little bit more spiritual like all these other people around me, but I just am who I am. And then about after three minutes, he says, well, where are you now? You know, my father became a neurologist in the end, a doctor of the brain. And he says that there is no scientist in the world that knows what consciousness is, why we think, why we are, where thoughts come from. No one has any clue where dreams come from. That's a whole other mystery. And who knows why we dream what we dream and where those dreams come from. But when that rabbi said, where are you now, an image came to my mind. I had a house on the mountain. And my kids are running through the grass and people are coming from all over the world and they're working in the land and they're learning Torah and they're praying in the mountains of King David. I'm like, wow, that would just be incredible. Is that possible? I mean, there's not even an electrical line there yet. I mean, that would be amazing. Anyway, the night ends. I'm about to go to bed. You know, went back home. We're lying in bed with my wife, Tehillah, and then Tehillah turns to me. and I was really just about to fall asleep and she's like, well, Jeremy, what did you dream? And I was like, oh, Tehila, I had the most awesome dream because we were there together. And I was like, we had a house on the mountain. Our kids were running through the grass. And I was like telling her this whole story. She jumps out of bed and she's like, I can't believe it. And I was sure that I had done something wrong (laughs) because that's usually the dynamic. (laughs) And she bursts into the baby room, which was like just a big half bedroom off of our bedroom. The baby starts to cry. I hear books fumbling off the shelf. She pulls out a notebook, flips through the pages, opens it up and throws it on the bed. And she's like, read this. And I look at it and it's her diary from when she was a little girl. So I met Tehila when she was 19. And I read her diary, it says, it's my 18th birthday. And I just had the most powerful dream. And I've never read any of Tehillah's journals before, and this dream happened before I even knew her. I'm living alone on a mountain, and my children are running through the grass, and people are coming from all over to volunteer and work in the land and learn how beautiful the Torah is. And I'm like, what is this? What is this dream? I mean, my wife is like high heels. She's a lawyer going to court, you know, a farmer on a mountain. What? Like this was not a part of the plan. And I'm reading this thing. And I just can't believe what I'm reading. And then the last two sentences in her diary journal are, I don't know how I'm going to get there. I'm going to need a partner to help me. But I believe this is what Hashem has for me in my life. What do you do with that? I felt like my free will was taken away from me at that point. Because what am I going to do? Why just, you know, how many dreams did Joseph have? Two? I'm getting, I mean, before I even knew my wife, a dream was planted in her. So powerful. That dream was a long lost forgotten memory. I'm 42. It's a little girl. Put it in her, put it on the shelf and just long forgotten. And all of a sudden, right as we're struggling to figure out what we should do, we're given this amazing guidance direct providence telling us where we should go. So I don't know, immediately all of my thoughts were like, what about my kids? What about my marriage? What about our money? What about the security? What about the Supreme Court? What about, I was okay. But then to live with the regret, why didn't you follow your dreams? That was just too big of a regret that I just couldn't live with. So we had to decide, are we gonna put our house on the market? And I want you to know where we drew our strength. The Jewish people every day, since the destruction of the temple, we pray every morning and every evening. There was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. And we pray whether we want to or not. And so there's sometimes where you're kind of praying and your heart's not really in it because you just got to do what you got to do. And that sometimes makes it a little bit ritualistic, not so good. But we do what we have to do and we're committed. But then there's also a lot of power to that. Every morning. 
we wake up in the morning and we say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. And then we go to bed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. Every morning and every evening. Every morning and every evening. If you love God, you say it. And if you don't love God at that moment, you say it. If you want to say it, if you don't want to say it, every morning and every evening. And in Hebrew, it's even a little bit more powerful because the translation there is a little bit, well, they did their best. They had to choose something. But the word in Hebrew isn't might. It says, Ve'hafta Tashem Elohecha, you should love the Lord your God, Bechol Levavcha, with all your heart, Bechol Nafshecha, with all of your soul, Uvechol, with all of Me'odecha, with all of your Me'od. And that word doesn't mean might. Me'od in Hebrew is very. Like, I love you very much. You say, I would love you, me'od. I love you very much. I like ice cream, me'od. Me'od, to love God with all of your very, that's not even grammatically correct. That doesn't make any sense. So just so you understand, the Jewish then, the Jewish way, there are 3,000 years of arguments about what that word means. 3,000 years the Jews are arguing. What is such an important verse? And it doesn't make any sense to love God with all of your very. What does that mean? So one says it's with all of your might. It means with all of your very. It means all of your might. Some say it's with all of your strength. Some say it's with all of your money. Some say it's with all of your possessions. Some say it's with all of your family. Some say it's with all of your time. Some say it's with all of your marriage. So, I mean, oh, with all of your mind, with all of your heart, with all of your emotions. I mean, everyone has a different... I mean, there's centuries upon centuries of different angles of what they think that word is really pointing us to. And now 2022, we're like, well, what? Who's right? There's all these different interpretations of what that word means. And I think the answer is they're all right. They're all right. That's why it says it like that. It's to love God with everything you have. In fact, it's interesting. The word very and every is almost the same thing. It's to love God with everything you got. And I, Tila and I said, this is our chance. This is our chance to love God with all of our money, with all of our family, with all of our marriage, with all of our time, with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our everything. We're going to put our house on the market. We put our house on the market and the house sold fast, too fast. I wanted like a little bit of time to kind of prep and get ready for the move. It sold really fast. And once the house, if the contract is signed and money is wired, there's you, the bridge is burned. You have got to get out. And I told them, listen, I need a little bit of time. I have to build my staff house on the property. I'm already uh, kind of halfway there, but I'm going to need, you know, a few more months than usual. Well, we were, I, the truth is I was ecstatic. I was like, we are being guided by God. We are never, we are just, we are on the wave. We are going to do something marvelous in the land of Israel that is going to be something like no one has ever seen. We are going to build something that is going to change the world. And as soon as I sold my house, it was as if the, the gates of hell opened up in my life. And everything wrong that could have happened in that journey to the mountain and on the mountain went wrong at the same time. I have to keep my beard really short because in those eight months, I became so white. The stress and the anxiety and the fear and the sleepless nights, it was so, I, it, like, it turned me white when I shouldn't be so white. So I keep it short because it, it was, I don't know, it was the, I've served in three wars in the land of Israel. I served in the military for over 20 years. Moving to that mountain with my six kids, the Hamas have nothing on that. That was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me by far. Well, sold my house, and a few weeks later, I get a registered note in the mail. It's pretty rare. Go to the post office and sign off on it, and I opened up, and it's a lawsuit in Israel's Supreme Court. The lawsuit is saying they're going to destroy everything on our farm. They're going to uproot all of our trees, raise every building, our house of prayer that was almost being, like, I was like, almost done on the outside, destroyed. Our educational center that we were building to bring people there to spend time on the mountain, it was going to be destroyed. My home that was already, I don't know, 60, 70 percent done, done. Everything that we had built for four or five years, everything was just going to be destroyed. And I'm like, what is this going on? Denmark, Norway, and Germany, they're behind. We're going to lose we are going to lose this lawsuit. How can four farmers go up against Denmark, Norway, and Germany? They have endless money. And I mean, that is, why are they even suing us? Imagine if we were to go to the edge of the desert in Arizona and try to build something for the economy of Arizona where no one wants to build anything. We'll build a spiritual retreat where people can come and pray. They'd probably be awarded a prize in Arizona for being pioneers. We're being sued by Germany, Norway, and Denmark. 
I mean, imagine that. Corona, inflation, unemployment. Let's go stop these Jews from settling the land of Israel. It's irrational. Like there is no logical way to explain that other than we had awoken some spiritual force. There's no logical way to explain why nation states are suing four families that are building a mountain in the middle of the desert. It's totally irrational, but it was also terrifying because how are we going to win? So I'm like, oh, okay, okay, I don't know. How am I going to tell this to Tehillah's parents? Where are we going to sue in Israel's Supreme Court? Okay, well, let's just one step in front of the other. Let's just keep on moving. Two weeks later, I get an email from a Jewish woman in Switzerland. And she came out to the mountain about two years earlier. And uh, the mountain is something happens there. And she just felt God tell her that she needed to help us build our educational center. And she said, I know this is what I need to do. There is nothing more worthy. A house of prayer for all nations in the mountains of King David. I want to help you do it. And she sure said, all right, I'm committed. So I signed a contract with the contractor. And she started wiring us money every month. And we were building. And it was amazing. And then a few months into it, she get this email. The Swiss government has now notified me that every dollar that I've given to Israel is to be taxed 100%. I'm like, oh. She's like, I don't even have enough money to pay the taxes because I thought it was a tax-deductible donation. And now I'm being taxed 100%. Until we figure this out, I won't be able to complete my commitment to building the educational retreat center. I'm really sorry. And I'm like, it's okay, we'll, we'll hire lawyers here in Israel and we'll explain the situation to you and we'll figure this thing out. I'm so sorry that this is happening. I was like, well, I'll have to tell my contractor that we're not going to be able to finish the contract. I'm going to be in breach of contract. Oh, God, I, hope, I wonder how he's going to take to that. So the very next day, I told him as soon as possible so he would stop ordering supplies and we'd be able to figure this thing out. And I said, listen, there's an anti-Semitic policy in Switzerland. Every dollar that was donated to Israel has to be... And he's like, I'm sorry. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a builder. I'm not a politician. I have a contract here. I have supplies that I've purchased. I have people that I need to pay. I want my money. And I'm like, well, I am just so sorry, but there's money's not going to arrive. And there was just no money in our ministry right now. I don't... He's like, well, if I don't get my money, I am out of this project, and I'll see you in court. And I'm like, <gasps> whoa, wait, 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 wait. My staff house. I sold my house to build my house. I have to get out of my house. Don't not build my house. I have money for that. That will continue to come. I'll pay you even early. Whatever I need to do, don't not build my house because I won't have a home to live in. He's like, no, this was one package deal. I don't care where the money comes from. If I don't get my money, I am out. And the next week, he was out, and I had no home to move to. And I'm like, okay, well, I have six children and all of my stuff. And like Abraham, I'm just walking through the land. I was two weeks in Ashkelon, two weeks in Tiberias, two weeks in my parents' house until they kicked us out, two weeks in Tehillah's parents' house until they kicked us out. And I'm like, oh, how does this happen? And eventually I was like, I guess we have to move to the mountain. But we didn't have a kitchen. We didn't have a door. Never mind a toilet. We didn't have a house. wasn't finished yet. But we had nowhere else to go. So I brought my wife and my six kids to an unfinished house on the most dangerous real estate in Israel with no door. So at nighttime, I have to patrol around my house, and I have a good loyal partner named Ari. So I took from 12 until 3 in the morning, guarding my house, walking around it like that, because I have six of my treasures there. And then from 3 until 6, he would guard. And then we wake up in the morning exhausted, trying to figure out how are we going to beat Germany and the Supreme Court were in hundreds of thousands of shekels in debt and we don't go into debt We like save our money diligently and when we have enough money We'll buy a used car and what are we gonna do and how did this happen to me? And do you know what a compost toilet is? For those of you that don't know what a compost toilet is It's kind of a closet that you build outside of your house and it's a bucket in the closet at the compost toilet it's a bucket and you kind of poop in the bucket and then you throw wood chips on it six kids in the morning i have to get three mountain tops over to catch the school bus and i'm like emuna on the compost toilet quickly 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 okay okay you're off no i'm you're now on the compost toilet quickly okay okay we have to, five more minutes we got to get to the mountain top over and i'm like how has this become my life what have i done what have i done and i would go to bed at night with so much stress of how are we going to get out of debt how are are we going to win? They're going to destroy everything we've built. I'm, I have to be up in a few more hours to go guard. What have I done to my I had such a good life. I had such a good life. What was I following my dreams? 
Oh, I'm crazy. <gasps> That's what it is. I didn't realize that I was crazy. It's not rational to follow your dreams. And this whole time, there's no spirituality in my life. Like the cut off, there was no communication. I was just alone in the desert, literally a madman on a mountain with a compost toilet. I don't know what to do, and I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. And, you know, I was nervous going there, and I was married to Dila for 15 years. And the truth is, I didn't know who I was married to. You know, if you want to make something strong, you push it to its limits, maybe even a little bit beyond its limits, to make it stronger and to see how strong you really are. And as I'm crumpled up in the fetal position, I might as well have been sucking my thumb. <laughs> what have I done? Tahila never complained. My wife, I'm so strong, strongest woman. I, I didn't know who I was married to. She's like, compost toilets, oh, they're so ecological. This is amazing. We should always have compost toilets in the house. And I'm like, what? No compost toilets. And she's like, we're never going to regret this. We're following our dreams. She was just like, unbelievable. And I'm literally, it's embarrassing because I'm a platoon sergeant in the IDF. And I'm like going to bed at night with tears. I'm like, what have I done to myself? I did this to myself. What have I done? And Tahila is just unshakable. And it was like a new love emerged for my wife that never would have happened because I didn't know who I was married to until I saw what I saw. And imagine what we're doing to our kids now. It's like they have safe zones and triggers and everyone's trying to protect them. And it's like they're trying to almost the academia here, the universities are trying to wake weak children. It's like Joshua said, be strong and courageous. And they're making weak cowards in the universities here where they don't want to pressure them. They don't want to, they don't want to scare them with ideas that might challenge their woke theories. It's like the opposite so they can control these weak cowards. And all of a sudden, I saw my wife so strong and so courageous, like Joshua's blessing resting upon my wife that I never knew. And it was so challenging and so hard. And finally, the holidays passed, and we started reading the Torah portions of the week again. You know, for those of you that don't know the Torah portion, we finish all five books of Moses once a year. And we start them right after the biblical feasts. And so we started reading the stories of Abraham. And the Torah portion is really a powerful idea. It's like one section of the five books of Moses and one section of the prophets that's read by every Jew around the world at the same time. And now it's Believers all over the world are all plugging into the same message, but imagine what that means. It's like God's chosen, all the believers are all reading God's word at the same time. It's like one message is being transmitted to everyone at the same time, and it speaks to you personally. It's miraculous. It's unbelievable, and never in my life did I have the Torah portion speak to me so powerfully because we're introduced to Abraham in chapter 12 in Genesis. And God says to Abraham, go to yourself to the land that I will show you. And I'm like, that is the template that I'm living. I'm trying to model myself, I'm trying to be guided. God, I really thought you were calling me here. I just was alone. And then after Abraham has that call, there's no communication. He's walking from Babylon to the land of Israel. And for days, just walking, not even knowing exactly where to go. And then we have a Midrash, an oral Jewish tradition that tells us what happened. Satan comes to Abraham and says, you didn't hear right. Oh, you think you're hearing voices. You're actually crazy. You're a madman. You're walking off into the desert, and he has no communication with God, and he just has to keep on walking. And I'm like, okay, well, I should try to keep on walking. But if I were to be the author of the Torah, I would say, well, I want to teach people to live a guided life. Listen to the light that's inside you. Listen to your heart that's calling you to be good, that's calling you to be better, that's calling you to be who God destined you to be. Abraham does that. And I would say, well, when he arrives in the promised land, he should be blessed. Follow that voice in your life and you'll be blessed. That's what I would write, but that's not what happens. Abraham arrives in the land of Israel and there's a famine in the land, and he almost dies of starvation. Being in debt is not fun. Dying of starvation, that's the worst. Like, you have no food. There's no rain. His animals are dying. He has nothing to eat. He comes to the promised land, promised to be blessed, and all he sees is no, like, di almost dying of starvation. He has to escape down to Egypt. And in Egypt, he doesn't meet Norway, Denmark, in Germany, or Switzerland, but another tyrannical dictator. He meets Pharaoh, and Pharaoh kidnaps his wife. 
And then he comes back to the land, and he has to struggle with the Arabs that are in the land, over that land. And I'm like, what is the Torah trying to teach us here? Follow God's voice in your life, and you'll almost die of starvation and have your wife kidnapped? I mean, what kind of book is that? That's the worst sales pitch I've ever heard in my life. And I think that's actually what it's doing. It's not a sales pitch. It's just telling you the truth. Just if you walk in the light and you follow God's voice in your life, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. On the contrary, in fact, it was the challenges and struggles and tests that Abraham lived through and overcame that built him into who he was, the father of every Jew, the father of every Christian, the father of every Muslim, the most influential man in world history. It was those challenges that built him into who he was. And as I started getting strength, one by one, all of the challenges that were impossible to win, impossible to overcome, one by one, they passed. God, in the most miraculous ways, somehow four farmers beat three nation states. The tax issue in Switzerland was solved. We got out of debt and we started building our mountain. And it was incredible. Before Corona, people from all over the world were coming to our mountain. And when I say all over the world, I mean from Korea, from China, from all over Europe, from Africa, from America. We barely have cell phone reception. And I don't know how these groups are even coming to the mountain, but they're coming from all over the world. And then people would come to our house of prayer that we built for them. And they would pass around a hat, and then they would leave. 50 euros, 20 euros, $10, $100, and then we'd get a little bit more cement, a little bit more metal, and go around and keep on building, and then slowly another stone and another round and another round, and slowly we gathered more stones from the mountain, built itself into this house of prayer that was built by the nations, a house of prayer for all nations built by the nations themselves in the mountains of King David. It was like their dreams were coming to pass. We have a little patch of grass that our kids were playing in on Shabbat. Who could have imagined And then Corona struck. No tourism, no groups, nothing. You're alone. And in Israel, they took that stuff seriously. I mean, there was no tourism in Israel. There was no tourism from out of Israel. You couldn't leave your house for a long time. And we were isolated alone on a mountain. And it was, at the beginning, pretty terrifying. I'm like, how are we going to water these trees now? I mean, there was an engine that was being run by tourism, and now they've just shut us down. So many businesses in Israel had to shut down. I mean, taxi drivers, they're gone. Tour guides, there, it's over for them. Hotels are shutting down. Not, there's no tourism. I mean, our whole place was destined to be a tourist location. What are we going to do with no tourism? What are we going to do now? And I said, well, well I knew that I wasn't going to fall into a panic. I'm never doing that again. I mean, what I learned in that time was that I lived through hell on earth. That's what it felt like. I was in the hell fires of anxiety, of depression, of fear. It was so hard. But looking back now, I did that to myself. I did that. I was so consumed and fearful of what would be. None of it came to pass. I was so fearful of how we're going to get over this and how we're going to overcome that and what's going to be in the future and what I'm going to be homeless and I'm going to be penniless. None of that actually happened. If only I had the faith of Tehillah, where she just said, God is guiding us in our dreams and we're never going to regret this. So that was a lesson that I learned hard. <laughs> But that lesson is ingrained in me. So now I went out to the mountains and I said, God, okay, you have a mission for us. You brought us out to this mountain. What am I to do now? No one's coming here. And I said, well, this mountain is a mission. It's, it's, it's more than just a place. It's just a vehicle to accomplish a mission. And what is that mission? Well, we talked about all these prophecies that came to pass in our generation. The revival of the Hebrew language, the ingathering of the exiles, the blossoming of the land of Israel. But all of that happened to my father's generation decades ago. What about our generation? What is supposed to happen now? Here's what it says in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 14. Sing and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, the word of Hashem. Many of the nations will join themselves to God on that day, and they will become a people unto me, and I will dwell in your midst. The next thing that's supposed to happen is that among the nations of the world, People will be pulled out of those nations, attach themselves to God, and a new people is born. They become a people unto me. There was this Jewish people that was chosen, 
an eternal covenant, and that's quite a testimony because the Jewish people are the only eternal people alive today. All of the ancient peoples of the Bible are gone. The Jebusites, the Moabites, the Canaanites, the Amalekites, the Egyptians of Pharaoh. The Egyptians today are not the same gods, not the same people. All of the ancient peoples of the Bible, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, they're all gone. Only the Jewish people remained an eternal covenant with Israel. They were the chosen ones. And then God says, no, no, many of the nations are going to come and join us, and they will become a people unto me. A new people is born, God's people. The next verse says, then you will know that Hashem, master of legions, has sent me to you. God will take Judea as his heritage, his portion upon the holy land. So as President Biden comes to the land of Israel now to take Judea away from the Jews, God has another thing it planned. He's like, no, 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 Judea, that's my heritage on the Holy Land. No one's going to touch that. He will choose Jerusalem again. And so here we are at the edge of Judea, trying to build this, mat, this place that the nations will be able to come, feel the spirit of King David in the mountains of Israel. <laughs> and then Zechariah, chapter 8, this is such a beautiful prophecy. Thus said Hashem, master of legions, in those days it will happen that ten men of all the different languages of the nations will take hold of the corner of a garment of a Judean man, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So it seems as though there need to be Jews from Judea that reach out to the nations, and the nations reach back. And it's not all of the nations, it's like ten men from the nations, small pockets of people that look at the mainstream society of their nations and be like, I don't know what's so woke about this. I don't want to be a part of that. I mean, we arrived here at the end of June, and I don't know much about American culture. I definitely didn't know that the month of June was a month dedicated to insanity. But we just got into the car and turned on the radio, and it was like, pride this, trans that. We're like, whoa, whoa, change the radio station. Next radio station. Pride, pride, gender, whoa, next. was just pride. It was on every radio station, every commercial. Just turn the radio off. <laughs> turn the radio off. And I'm like, it's a month. A month of the children of this country have to be bombarded with ungodliness, breaking up the family, breaking up natural order. I mean, the end of days, it says that lies will look like truths and truths will look like lies. And I always was struggling with that because I was like, well, if it's a really good lie, no one will ever know because a really good lie looks like the truth until they said boys are girls and girls are boys. That can only happen in the city. No one with a flock of sheep will ever say that, well, all of my girl sheep are acting like boys, totally fine with me. Anyone that has a cow that can't tell the difference between the girl cow and the boy cow, milk is not coming out of the boy cow. And so that's just, it's people that are so removed from nature. And you know, God created nature, man created city. And so one step closer to nature is one step closer to God. And so once they said that boys are girls and lies are truths, and if you say otherwise, They'll kick you off Twitter. They'll shadow ban you on Facebook. The Tower of Babel has one language, and if you step out of the language that they want you to speak, you will be kicked out of their kingdom. And so look at what's happening. And so why are the Jews now meant to reach out to the nations? So the Jews have lasted. I mean, the Babylonians, they're gone. Assyrians are gone. Greeks, in their Hellenized ways, they swept over the world. They're gone. This woke thing is just the newest fad. They're going to be gone soon, and the Jews will remain because we have a Torah that never changes. There is a word that has never changed, a moral standard that doesn't bend with the times. It doesn't ever go left or right. It's just righteousness. And so to bring that to the world that needs the Torah so much, and that's what it says, the Torah will go forth from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. Nations will stream to Israel to learn how to walk. And I thought that was such an amazing language because I always read it stream like water. But you stream on the internet. And I said, that's maybe what we should do if that's our mission. So let's start broadcasting from our mountain. Let's broadcast and see what happens. It's meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. Let's bring the Torah from Judea to the world and see who comes. And you wouldn't believe what happened. Hundreds of people from all over the world started joining this online fellowship from our mountain. From 50 
countries, hundreds and more hundreds and more. And it was like, what is going on? And I'm looking at the faces on Zoom, which was a new technology that seemed like just came up right in the nick of time. And we have Catholic nuns, and we have few Muslims, and Jewish rabbis, and Christian pastors, and they're all in this one fellowship, learning together, praying together. And I'm Catholic nuns are on Zoom with a penguin thing, like the whole, I'm looking at them. I'm lo- and I'm like, hey, who are these people? They are in the fellowship, and they're Jews from Judea that are bringing all these people together what is going on and I was like that never would have happened had like our farm not been shut down and now I mean I I, for the first time I'm, I'm going around the United States and I'm meeting all of these families that were virtual realities they were faces on a screen they were suddenly just names without even the screen just listening to our teachings every Sunday And then now they're meeting each other, and all of them, there's a common thread between all of them. They want to live a guided life. And that means that it's really easy to live a guided life when you have the Torah, because there's some things that you can do, and there's some things you shouldn't do. And so walk more in the Bible. Walk more in those ways. And so I want to end with just one more prophecy. And it's one of the most beautiful messianic prophecies in the Bible. It's in the book of Isaiah in chapter 56. And maybe it's for this purpose that I came here today. So Isaiah chapter 56 reads like this. Verse 3. Oh, excuse me, verse 2. Praiseworthy is the man who does this, the person who grasps it tightly, who guards the Sabbath against desecrating it, and guards his hands against doing any evil. So the prophecy starts out with two. A man, not a Jew. Men. First, there's light and there's dark. That was the first thing created. Back to fundamentals. There's good and there's evil. There's light and there's dark. Stay away from doing the evil. Just walk in the light. But also it says to guard the Sabbath. I mean, that's unique because the Sabbath, it is in the Ten Commandments. The Torah is kind of like the love letter that God gave Israel. The Ten Commandments is like the engagement ring. You don't really need to read the Bible. Everyone knows the Ten Commandments. It's everywhere. But number four in the Ten Commandments is to honor the Sabbath. And if we say that there is this law that's like a bar, it's a tree of life, hold on to it because the world is going to sweep us away and it's a tree of life to those who grasp it. You have to hold on to it. And if we take the Ten Commandments seriously, the seventh day is the Sabbath to honor it, to guard it. It's God's day. Let not the stranger, let not the non-Jew, the stranger to Israel, who has joined himself to God, speak saying, God will utterly separate me from his people. Don't say that, because a new people is to be born. That is a part of Israel. That is God's people. Let not the barren one say, oh, behold, I'm just a shriveled tree. For thus said God to the barren ones, who observe my Sabbaths and choose what I desire and grasp my covenant tightly. In my house and within my walls, I will give them a place of honor and renown, which is better than sons and daughters. Eternal renown I will give them, which will never be terminated. The righteous among the nations that decide to live a little bit more by the Torah, who honor the Sabbath, They're going to be given more honor and renown than the children of Israel themselves, than the sons and daughters of Israel. My children, of course they're going to keep Shabbat. They live in Judea. They're my children. Of course they're going to do that. But in Amarillo, Texas, to make something special out of the seventh day, to do something that honors that day, that guards it, that doesn't let you ruin it, that lets you keep it something special for you and your family, those people that have broken from the mainstream, Well, they deserve more honor and renown than the children and daughters of Israel. The verse continues, just in case we weren't sure how important the Ten Commandments are. And then the strangers who join themselves to God to serve him, to love the name of God, to become servants unto him. All who guard the Sabbath against desecration and grasp my covenant tightly. I will bring them to my holy mountain and I will gladden them in my house of prayer. Their elevation offerings and their feast offerings will find favor on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And that's how the prophecy ends. And somehow there is a dividing line 
there are the people that say, you know, I'm going to take the Torah seriously because we need roots now. We need a bar. We need to hold on tight or this world is going to sweep us away. And then I realized that's what Israel is. That's what our purpose is. There's only 12 million Jews. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says in the exile, we'll remain few in number. 12 million. When you count people in China, it's 1.3 million plus or minus 12 million. So the Jews are a statistical error when counting Chinamen. That's how small we are. You could throw all of the Jews into China and you would try to count the Chinese people, we might all get lost. Just lose us all. We're a fraction of a fraction of a people. But you don't really see the roots. We're just the roots and we're rooted in one land. We're rooted in one place. But then what about the people of Amarillo? What about the people in Colorado? So from those roots in the land of Israel, a tree emerges and branches reach all over the world. And then once those branches are rooted in the land, connected to the Jewish people, living by God's word, it's unshakable. It can't come. Floods will come and winds will come, but that tree is a tree of life. And that's what's meant to happen now. One tree, one new people that's rooted in the land of Israel and that has branches around the world. And so I just wanted to bless you all. The next time you come to Israel, there is a farm waiting for you. There is a farm and you will love it there. And the second thing is that to encourage you to walk more in the word, to walk it out, to live it, to hold it, to grasp it, to honor it. Blessing will come there, absolutely, to be an example for you and everyone around you. And to enjoy, invite you, invite you to join us. And if you can't come into the land, then you can absolutely join our fellowship. And we broadcast every city, bring out the destiny that God has for you. So thank you all so much for coming tonight. Wow, what could I say? Uh, if this is your first time to hear Jeremy, it, it just doesn't stop. It's amazing. And he's available to do some questions and answers. Some of you may need to leave at school night, that sort of thing. But hang on, he'll answer questions. You can come and talk to him individually after we get through with that. So let's take a couple of questions. Okay, so there's two, po two stages. Stage one is questions and answers for the brave ones that want to have actually a conversation and bring it up to the public. And live, the recording will be sent to you the very next day. And it is the Torah from the land of Israel. And it's somehow, it's amazing because when you talk to Jews, there's like a way to talk to Jews. You speak a little bit of Hebrew in it. And when you talk to Christians, there's like a Christian. So in Hebrew, tzivaot, tzava is army. So the master of legions uh, hosts, it's not bad. You got to choose one of them. But I think legions is actually a little bit more true to the Hebrew there. Master of legions. Right. Hmm. Legions, yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, but I've actually found the King James translation is really, really accurate. There's some times where I sort of disagree with it, but for the most part, it was a really good translation. They're pretty accurate to the Hebrew a lot of times. Any other questions? Yes? <laughs> yeah, that was Ari. Ari signed up for an absorption program, and he didn't know Hebrew, and they didn't know he was Ethiopian, and so he ended up being one American with about 80 other Ethiopians, and that was his beginning introduction into Israel, and that was the greatest way that he ever introduced himself. I mean, he was so thrilled to be there in the end. Um, he said he felt like the white sheep, but other than that... Um, he said, you know, it was, it was awesome because the, the, the Jews of Ethiopia, Israel is the first country to bring blacks to their land as brothers, not as slaves. And they were Jews lost many years ago, and they were brought back to the land, and Ari was just, um, just a, a one among them. So that was his beginning. You know, Ari's my, command, uh, my soldier in the army. And so I love this story because his Hebrew wasn't great, and his first day in the IDF, it's basic training. And basic training in the IDF is very serious. I mean, discipline is everything. When you say, you say be here at 2.05, you need to be there at 2.05. And so they're taking 18-year-old wild boys and converting them into disciplined soldiers. So you can understand that timing is everything. And Ari's first day in the IDF, he comes late.
to meeting his officers for the first time. And it wasn't exactly his fault because he was a lone soldier from Houston, Texas. He left his family behind, went to Israel to serve in the IDF, and they were sort of talking, well, where is he going to go for the weekends? Who's doing his laundry? He's alone here. And so in that meeting with that secretary, he came late to his first meeting. But what is he going to do? All of the soldiers are standing at attention. His officers are being introduced to the unit for the first time, and Ari's late. So Ari comes running across the base. He sees that he's late. He has terror in his eyes. And instead of apologizing for being late, which would be slicha shani me'uchar, Ari says slicha shani mechoar, which means I'm sorry that I'm ugly. <laughs> and so if you could imagine what that looked like, excuse me, sirs, I'm sorry for being so ugly. And then everyone in the unit's like, what? <laughs> what? The? And then one guy in the group was like, tough break. <laughs> And then everyone started to laugh because no one ever sees a spectacle like that in the IDF before. What was that? Who is this Texan that's calling himself ugly, apologizing? What did, they, what did they do with him? And then everyone's laughing, and then the officers started to laugh because what? And then the last thing that you want to do on your first day in basic training is make your platoon sergeant laugh because now he has to prove that he doesn't have a sense of humor. And then for the rest of the day, the whole unit was punished to restore order into the IDF, crawling through thorn bushes and running up and down mountains. And everyone's so angry at this Texan for making everyone punished now. And that was like his introduction into the IDF, like no one else. Only Ari could pull that off. And so I love that story. Um, all right, my friends. So is there anyone else? Yeah, oh, yes. That is a good question. We do sell the necklaces, but only at the farm. So you'll have to come all the way to Judea to take the land home with you. So we do still sell them. That's right. That was our beginning. It's amazing. You know, the Land of Israel necklace was how we first funded our, how we worked in the world. And I don't know why we love what we love. You know, some people, I don't know, they love bicycling. I love the land of Israel, since I just, who knows why we love what we love. But there is an idea that what you love is placed in your heart by God himself, because you can't control what you love, you just love what you love. And that love is really a little bit of a sign to like follow that if it's leading you in the right direction. And so somehow my love of the land of Israel has brought me to the deepest settlement in the land of Israel, and I just couldn't be happier. So yeah, that's early beginnings. All right, my friends, be blessed, and hopefully we'll see you in the mountains of Judea. Thank you, Jeremy. He'll be around, and you can visit with him. Thank you for being here. God bless you.